14 votes in favor, 0 vote against, 1 abstention. The draft resolution has been adopted. As 15 states, 14 voted yes, 1 refused to say anything, and the entire world was watching. This single vote may have very long lasting impacts. We are, of course, talking about the UN Security Council resolution that was passed on Monday demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza for the month of Ramadan. More than halfway through the month of fasting, we'd only be getting two weeks at most if all the guns went silent in Gaza. This is the first UN resolution on a ceasefire since the war began in October, but nothing seems to have happened on the ground, with more than 50 people killed in airstrikes just hours later. The death toll now stands at 32,000 people. More than 80% of them are women and children. U.S. rhetoric against Israel's actions in Gaza has gotten increasingly sharper, and with the U.S. abstaining from the U.N. vote, ensuring that it passes, Israel had a quick reaction with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancelling a planned trip to Washington. So what is the significance of this U.N. resolution? How binding is it? Who can make sure it goes into effect? And is this a pivotal moment in the Israel-Gaza war that has been going on for almost six months now? This is Beyond the Headlines, and I'm your host, Nada al Tahir. And this week, we'll be speaking to former U.S. ambassador to Yemen, Gerald Farstein, who served as a diplomat in several countries in the region, as well as the national's own U.N. correspondent, Adla Masoud, who covered this important moment. But first, a bit of context. The U.S. had vetoed similar resolutions in the past, calling for an immediate ceasefire. Then, it brought its own resolution to the Security Council, which Russia and China vetoed. Why? It's all in the wording. More on that later. Let's go to Adla Masoud to learn a bit about Monday's vote, which the U.S. has said is, quote, non-binding. The resolution demands an immediate ceasefire for the month of Ramadan, respected by all parties leading to a lasting and sustainable ceasefire. Now, even though the U.S. has described the text as non-binding, all UN Security Council resolutions are considered binding in accordance with Article 25 of the UN Charter, which was ratified by the US. Now, if Israel chooses not to respect it, then it's going to be very hard to implement. Historically, Israel has repeatedly gotten away with flouting UN resolutions in the past. And ultimately, implementation is a question of international will. Uh, during Barack Obama's presidency, the UN Security Council passed a resolution deeming Israel's settlements in Palestine illegal and a violation of international law. The resolution passed with 14 votes and the US abstained. Israel ignored it. Will there be a ceasefire now? That's a hope, but not necessarily because both Israel and Hamas have to agree to a ceasefire. So what happens if the resolution isn't implemented or enforced? If a UN Security Council resolution is not followed, the Council can vote on a follow-up resolution addressing the breach and take punitive action and on sanctions or even authorize military force under Chapter 7. But this requires the adoption of another resolution. And as a veto-wielding member, the US is unlikely to let this happen. Now to Ambassador Gerald Firestein on what this all means. I asked him how he would categorize this US diversion of positions from Israel's with regards to Gaza. Is it a crack, a fracture, a full-blown rift in the relationship? What is it? The Biden administration has been trying for weeks now to signal to uh, to Bibi Netanyahu and his government that, uh, that the U.S. is increasingly uncomfortable with the direction of the Israeli military operations in Gaza and particularly in regard to whatever plan they may be developing uh, to go into Rafa. And and the reality is that despite fairly specific and very clear messages from the president, from the secretary of state, from secretary of defense and others, that, uh, that we were not on board with the Israelis here, uh, the uh, the Israeli government continues to insist that they're going to go ahead. Uh, and so I think that what we saw was the clearest signal yet uh, that the U.S. Uh, believes the time has come to wind down the military operations in Gaza, that we're very concerned about the humanitarian crisis there, that we're very concerned about the number of civilian casualties, 
and uh, and we want the Israelis to listen. Uh, and uh, I believe we got their attention uh, by abstaining on this resolution. I would assume that the U.S. voting yes would have caused a major break in the relationship with Israel, but the U.S. chose to abstain instead. How would you read that? You're absolutely right. I, I mean, the fact that the U.S. abstained and didn't veto is is the mildest step that they could have taken. In other words, they wanted the, the resolution to pass, but they didn't want to be on the record as actively supporting it. So uh, Netanyahu's response was, I think, in the view of, of certainly the administration and uh, probably most other observers, uh, a little bit over the top, if you will. I think uh, the administration's made clear that they had told the Israelis in advance that we were going to allow this resolution to go forward. Uh, there was no surprise. Uh, but again, you know, there is a domestic political context to all of this, both here in the United States and in Israel. Uh, and Netanyahu's reaction was almost certainly more aimed at addressing his base in Israel than it was in terms of the U.S.-Israeli relationship. What's the difference between this vote and the one that the U.S. submitted last week, which we know was vetoed by Russia and China? At some point, it seemed like a ceasefire resolution would never pass, but it's all in the wording, isn't it? The sequencing in the U.S. resolution was release the hostages and then uh, come to the ceasefire. Whereas the one that was voted still calls for the immediate release of all of the hostages. That hasn't changed, but it doesn't sequence it anymore. It uh, it delinks them, if you will, and says ceasefire and hostage release. What is the importance of this delinking that you talk about? The U.S., has now accepted the reality, accepted the view of the rest of the international community uh, that that there cannot be any preconditions, if you will, to a ceasefire, that there must be an immediate ceasefire, there must be an end to the threat uh, to uh, Palestinian innocent civilians. Uh, there must also be immediate steps uh, taken to address uh, the delivery of humanitarian supplies. And again, uh, the U.S. separately has made clear that while uh, we continue with these airdrops, uh, while there is now this new mechanism of the, uh, the supply to Gaza by sea, none of this is a substitute uh, or an adequate substitute for the ability of trucks to cross over into Gaza from Egypt and from other uh, border crossings. So I, I think that that the understanding now of the administration, and again, there's also a U.S. domestic political context, uh, which is that the Biden administration was under increasing pressure, particularly from Democrats, particularly from younger uh, Democrats, uh, to uh, to move. Uh, for uh, ceasefire. And so uh, I think that the Biden administration position now is a reflection both of the reality on the ground in Gaza, but also the reality on the ground here in the United States. People have been killed in double digits in Gaza 24 hours after the resolution was passed. Um, nothing has changed so far on the ground as far as we can see. Is this UN resolution just symbolic? Is it going to actually pause things? or result in repercussions for those who continue to fight? Is it binding? Or is it just a bunch of countries coming together just to say, stop? All Security Council resolutions are binding. Uh, there's no such thing as a non-binding Security Council resolution. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what's, what's happened, of course, is that uh, the government of Israel has said, we don't care what the Security Council says. We don't care what anybody else says. We're going to continue uh, with these operations because we consider them to be uh, so critically important. Uh, and so it really becomes an issue of enforcing the resolution. And I, I think that that falls on the Biden administration primarily uh, to make it clear that we expect 
that the government of Israel will uh, honor uh, the terms of the resolution. Uh, And so it's significant that the administration also has made the point, and I think this was Vice President Harris uh, who made the point, that there could be consequences if Israel fails to abide by the terms of the resolution. Uh, And that's important because in the past, uh, the president, even when uh, even when he was expressing uh, concern, even when he was expressing opposition, uh, went on to say, but we won't do anything to enforce it. Now, the rhetoric has shifted a little bit, and the administration is not ruling out the possibility that if Israel refuses to uh, abide by the resolution, we may take some additional steps. What those additional steps might be, uh, not clear, but it could be, um, you know, some kind of a cutoff of certain kinds of weapons. It could be some other kinds of things that put uh, pressure on the uh, government of Israel. And we should also note uh, that the UN uh, resolution has changed the nature of the debate inside of Israel and the reaction in Israel, at least among the left or the center left uh, uh, political spe- uh, uh, part of the spectrum uh, is now increasingly uh, hostile to the Netanyahu government. It has increased the pressure inside of Israel uh, for perhaps uh, the fall of the government, perhaps some other uh, major change in the way they have gone about this. We're hearing that a new Palestinian government might be sworn in soon which could be a huge step forward in the way things are done and how the government plays not only in the future of the people in the West Bank, but in Gaza too. What do you make of this development? It is um, particularly significant in terms of the day after. The move to bring in a new government uh, for the Palestinians uh, is a way of positioning them for the day after Uh, scenarios where, in fact, it is the view of the United States, as well as many others in the international community, that the Palestinian Authority should be in a position to actually um, uh, govern in both Gaza and the West Bank. Now, this has not been accepted by Netanyahu. He has refused uh, to accept the idea that the PA Uh, would be the the authority in Gaza. But it could very well be that if this government takes hold and demonstrates an ability to actually function, that the international community will rally around and uh, insist that they have to be given uh, the authority in Gaza. Now, of course, uh, we also know, and, and again, you know, there's also the long-standing issue of the rift between uh, Fatah and, and Hamas uh, over, you know, whether or not they can join forces and work together uh, in a unified coalition. You know, right now, uh, the the efforts to resolve their differences and bring them together haven't worked. Uh, but, you know, all of those things uh, need to be worked out. So in the short term, uh, the new government is, you know, it's important to evaluate whether or not it's it's going to win the support of the Palestinian people, whether it will be seen as uh, an improvement, a step forward over the last government. I've known Mohammed Shteya for many years. I, I think very well of him. Uh, we'll see uh, how the new team uh, works out. But that's mostly significant in terms of what happens after uh, this uh, this conflict is over and how we're going to move forward on rebuilding, reconstructing Gaza, addressing the the crisis uh, uh, for the population there, uh, but also how do we move into a political track uh, to try to once again bring an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is, I think, you know, certainly here in uh, most countries around the world, understood as the as the root cause of what's happening now. What about the negotiations in Doha? I mean, in what world will Hamas and Israel ever actually agree on anything? And what's going to happen there? What needs to change? It's difficult to, to say from the outside because so much is happening behind uh, you know, a, a smokescreen or in a smoke-filled room, if you will. Of course, as you know, 
uh, uh, you know, Netanyahu withdrew his negotiators uh, and said once again that the uh, Hamas position is uh, is not acceptable. It's uh, not realistic. And so, you know, how much of this is posturing? How much of this is is real? It's it's hard. It's hard to say. Each side has has their you know kind of red lines and their and their basic requirements. Uh, so you know, I, I think that I think that at some point there will be an agreement. Uh, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, these these things do end with some kind of uh, of an agreement, and I I suspect that they will here. But it will require certainly um, Israel to back off of these absolute you know demands that there not be any more Hamas, that there not be any more. Uh, you know, uh, armed uh, resistance in Gaza, uh, these things, uh, you know, simply, and it's been understood from the very beginning that they were unrealistic, that they were not achievable. You know, once once you back away from that demand, then uh, an awful lot becomes negotiable and you can come up with, uh, with some kind of an agreement that will, again, marry uh, the idea of releasing the uh, remaining hostages with uh, uh, Palestinian prisoner release, uh, as well as an end to military operations, and there are a number of other issues that have to be sorted. Uh, you know, there there is this question of you know the Israeli demands for a buffer zone in in northern Gaza, which the U.S. has said are not acceptable. Uh, there is also we haven't even touched on uh, the uh, the situation in the West Bank, uh, which is not um, at all good right now. Uh, and and how that's going to play into the ability of the two sides to reach some kind of an agreement. Do you think that part of the reason why people are so angry in the West Bank is partially because of the internal situation there? Will things actually get better in the West Bank with a stronger government? That's one part of the problem. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, a more effective PA uh, that actually could provide legitimate government services to the Palestinian people and could create a foundation for economic growth and expansion uh, is a critical element uh, for stabilizing the situation there. But you also, of course, have, and we shouldn't ignore the fact that you have a radicalized Israeli settler population in the West Bank, which has been enabled uh, by this current government um, in uh, Jerusalem, uh, and which is creating uh, significant uh, security problems uh, and and generating a, a, a blowback uh, by Palestinians. So it's not only the economy and governance, it's also security and security for Palestinians uh, in the West Bank particularly. Okay, so say the new Palestinian government is perfect. The U.S. has finally decided to take a stand on the global stage and pull its weight. You said the U.S. can choose to stop providing Israel with some weapons or create repercussions for Israel. What's the U.S. offering to Israel that it could use as a pressure point? Primarily, I would say that what the Israelis are getting right now um, are things like artillery shells, uh, you know, the bombs that, that they're dropping, that the Air Force is using. It's, it's munitions more than new weapons. It's not, um, there's no shortage of uh, weapons on the Israeli side. I think, you know, what, what I would say is that um, in answer to your basic question, what will it take? I think, frankly speaking, what it will take is a new government in Israel. Um, uh, the, the departure of uh, Bibi Netanyahu and people like Smotrich and Ben Gavir. If not, you know, I mean, I, I'm not saying that it needs to be a labor government, that you need to have a left wing government back in Israel. It could be a centrist government, uh, but one uh, that is, uh, you know, open and willing uh, to participate in a honest and true way. Uh, in a in a political process to end the Israeli Palestinian conflict, and and by by Netanyahu's own admission, uh, and not even an admission, a boast uh, that he has you know undermined and undercut uh, any kind of serious negotiation to that would lead to an independent Palestinian state for the last thirty years. 
Uh, and so you need a government in Israel that won't do that, that will actually be willing to implement, you know, UN Security Council Resolution 242 and, and the Oslo Accords and all the other agreements that uh, that they've signed and, and have uh, undermined. So uh, I think that that's what it would take. Now, you know, Netanyahu has made it very clear he's not going to leave voluntarily. Um, he will be dragged kicking and screaming from the prime minister's uh, office. But I do believe if the United States were were willing to stand up and say, you know, um, this has reached a point where we are going to suspend the delivery of these mes- uh, munitions, we are going to take a step back. Uh, my my guess is that that will unleash an earthquake, um, a political earthquake in Israel uh, that will be the blow that will bring down the Netanyahu government. Bibi Netanyahu is far weaker today uh, because of the UN Security Council resolution and the US abstention uh, than he was last week. Uh, even though the, the, the fractures in the US-Israeli relationship were already there, but the fact that the U.S. took that step of allowing the resolution to go through, even uh, even though we had vetoed a similar resolution several times in recent months, um, has has created a real political storm in Israel. I think the U.S. announcing that there will be consequences for the failure uh, to implement that Security Council resolution. Uh, will be enough to to bring Netanyahu down, and hopefully, then we can have uh, a a new government in Israel that will be uh, open to a, a real negotiations. If Netanyahu doesn't go anywhere anytime soon, what will it take for Israel to bring in the aid, the same aid that we know is needed not only immediately for basic survival of Gazans, but also for the future rebuilding of Gaza, knowing full well that Israel says it's letting the aid through, but then the UN is saying entire truckloads of aid is being turned back because they contain, quote, a prohibited item, like scissors in a medical kit for children, for example. We've also spoken to NGOs that have said that this list is just getting longer and longer. I think it would require the US to to basically say, uh, this is going to be done and and you need to get out of the way. Uh, And whether, you know, Joe Biden is emotionally willing to to do that, I think I think he's getting closer. But whether he's willing to do that is is the big question mark. Uh, You know, there has to be. uh, Remember, uh, you know, uh, the the administration put out that uh, that line that, you know, that Biden was saying that he was going to have a come to Jesus uh, conversation with with Netanyahu, which would be, uh, you know, kind of an interesting conversation. But uh, but that's what it would require. And whether he's willing to actually do it or not is the big question. The horrific situation in Gaza is having serious impacts on domestic affairs in Palestine, in Israel and the U.S., which in itself is worth watching and worth learning about. Thank you, Ambassador Gerald Firestein and Adla Masoud for your contributions today. This is Beyond the Headlines, and this episode was produced by Arthur Edison and Dua Farid. I've been your host, Nada Al-Tahir. If this is the first time you're listening to us, please subscribe. If not, we'll see you next week.